Greetings to those who watch below. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at some of the strangest and most mysterious occult objects in history. But before we start, I'd like to say thank you to those who dwell below, an exclusive channel membership that you can check out using the link in the description box. So thank you to Steffi Ray, Wicked Witch, Lisa Watts, Lefty Kim, M.A. Way, Julie B, Jess Black Curtain, Christina Groves, Chris BLK Chris, Canopsia, Tegan S, The Real CFED22, Tesos Karamaris, and LT Punisher 666. Thank you to every single one of you for supporting the channel. Other ways that you can support the channel include checking me out on Instagram at brimstone underscore below and on Facebook at brimstone below horror channel. Also, if you haven't already, you can subscribe to the channel, hitting that notification bell so that you never miss a video. But for now, sit back, relax, and enjoy. The Hand of Glory The Hand of Glory is a mythical artifact that was said to heal ailments, protect thieves from discovery, and to act as a warning to others of the consequences of crime. Until the middle of the 19th century, the Hand of Glory was a popular piece of equipment for thieves as they committed their crimes. To create one, it required the hand of a still hanging corpse. It was vital that the corpse had been sentenced to hanging. Typically, a murderer's right hand was taken, as it was assumed the dead man would have been right-handed. For the enchantment to work, the hand used must be the one that committed the crime. The hand would most often be used as a candle itself, though would sometimes be used as a candle holder. In stories where the fingertips act as the candle, each finger would represent each person in the home that was asleep. If a finger wouldn't catch fire, it indicated that either someone in the home was awake, or that there were less than five people in the house. Many thieves misjudged the number of people in the house, and often this was their downfall. It was also said that the flame of a hand of glory could only be extinguished with milk or blood, any other liquid would only embolden the blaze. Back in the 19th century and before, thieves would do anything to reduce the risk of being caught. At this time, burglary was punishable by death, so the stakes were high. Accounts differ from source to source on what the Hand of Glory could do, but the magic powers bestowed fell into four main things. First and foremost is that the Hand would put to sleep anyone that was awake in a house, and render them in a coma-like state until the flames were extinguished. Secondly, the hand would give light to only the holder, casting all others into darkness, which was akin to the holder becoming invisible. Thirdly, is that any lock could be opened in and around of the vicinity where the hand was lit. And finally, the flames of the hand of glory could burn forever without perishing. Creating a Hand of Glory was no mean feat. There were rituals to observe, rules to follow, and a process that made it a skilled endeavour. First off, the hand had to be severed from a hanging corpse on a lunar eclipse. Instructions state that this was to be at the dead of night, though whether this was essential to the spell or to avoid being caught is not mentioned. In 1722, the Petit Albert, a popular magical textbook of the day, captured the imagination of the public. Sinister and esoteric in equal measures, the book was inspired by the writings of Saint Albertus Magnus of Cologne. The popularity of such a text illustrated the bleak interest in the dark arts and forbidden content of black magic. The recipe for creating a hand of glory from the book is as thus. Take the right or left hand of a felon who is hanging from a gibbet beside a highway, Wrap it in part of a funeral pole, and so wrapped squeeze it well. Then put it into an earthenware vessel, with zimat, nitre, salt, and long peppers, the whole well powdered. Leave it in this vessel for a fortnight, then take it out and expose it to full sunlight during the dog days until it becomes quite dry. If the sun is not strong enough, put it in an oven with fern and vervain. Next, make a kind of candle from the fat of a gibbeted felon, virgin wax, sesame, and pony, and use the hand of glory as a candlestick to hold this candle when lighted, and then those in every place into which you go with this baneful instrument shall remain motionless. If the hand were to be used as a candle, they covered it in wax. If not, 
the hand was ready to be used as a candle holder for a magical candle. One of the last remaining examples of a hand of glory is kept in the Whitby Museum in England. Witch Bottles Contractors demolishing the chimney of a former inn and pub in Watford, England, recently chanced upon a creepy surprise. Namely, a bottle full of fish hooks, human teeth, shards of glass, and an unidentifiable liquid. As the BBC News reported, the 19th century vessel is likely a witch bottle, a talisman intentionally placed in a building to ward off witchcraft. The newly discovered bottle is one of more than a hundred recovered from old buildings, churchyards, and riverbanks across Great Britain. Most specimens trace their origins to the 1600s, when continental Europe was in the grips of a major witch panic. Common contents found in witch bottles include pins, nails, thorns, urine, finger clippings, and hair. But what does a witch bottle do, and how does it work? Practitioners filled the vessels with an assortment of items, but most commonly urine and bent pins. The urine was believed to lure witches travelling through a supernatural otherworld into the bottle, where they would then be trapped on the pin-sharp points. Would-be witchcraft victims often embedded the protective bottles under hearths or near chimneys, because at the time people thought that witches gained access to homes through deviant paths such as the chimney. Interestingly enough, it's also thought that these vessels could have been thought to act as curatives that could bring a home's residents longevity and health. John Dee's Scrying Mirror and Crystal John Dee was an Elizabethan mathematician, astronomer, astrologer, alchemist and occultist, and was also known for being an advisor to Queen Elizabeth I. There are many occult items that are attributed to John Dee, including the clawed glass and his crystal. The clawed glass was a device consisting of a black glass mirror stored in a shark skin case. It was thought to have belonged to Dee. A clawed glass was normally used by artists, travellers and connoisseurs of landscapes. It was named after the artist Claude Loran, a 17th century landscape painter whose name is synonymous with the artistic movement. It is believed that Dee used his clawed glass as a crystal ball to look into the future, a practice known as scrying and a form of divination. Divination has been used for thousands of years to forecast the course of an illness or to find the best treatment. The practice involves an attempt to predict the future from signs and symbols. Dee spent much of his life devoted to alchemy, divination and hermetic philosophy. According to records, the object has belonged to Lady Betty Germain, from whom it passed to the Duke of Argyle and later to Horace Walpole. The documentation records show that the Wellcome Historical Medical Museum, now the Wellcome Trust, accessioned the object into their collection in 1937. John Dee's crystal is a clear-cut purple crystal attached to a chain and a ring. Dee claimed that the crystal was given to him by the angel Uriel in 1582, and instructed him and his assistant Edward Kelly on how to make the Philosopher's Stone, every alchemist's ultimate goal. Dee believed that he had the ability to contact angels and spirits, and claimed that angels had dictated several books to him. After Dee's death, the crystal was passed down to his son Arthur Dee, who gave it to Nicholas Culpepper as a reward for curing his liver illness. Culpepper was a physician and an alchemist who used the crystal to cure illnesses until 1651, when he claimed a demonic ghost emerged from it. Records show that the Wellcome Trust acquisitioned the item into their collection in 1936. In with this is also a statement about Dee's crystal, written by Nicholas Culpepper on the back of a deed, and is also on display. It was written on the 7th of March 1651, and gives a historical insight into the crystal and how Culpepper came to acquire it. The Codex Gygus The Codex Gygus is the world's largest preserved medieval manuscript. In Latin, the name Codex Gygus means giant book. It is 3 feet tall, 20 inches wide, 
nearly 9 inches thick and weighs around 165 pounds. The binding consists of leather and ornamental metal. Each page shows impeccable precision and a relentless attention to detail. This outstanding work includes the entire Latin Bible, Isidore of Seville's Encyclopedia Etymologia, Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews, and Cosmas of Prague's Chronicle of Bohemia. Additionally, it includes numerous writings describing magical formula, exorcism rituals, and a calendar. The Codex Gigas was supposed to contain all of the world's knowledge among the pages of a single book. The Codex continues to amaze, with unique colours and flawless details adorning this medieval manuscript. Various aspects continue to perplex even the most knowledgeable historians. Experts don't know the answer to how the book was even composed. This is mostly because of the imbalance between the book's comprehensive attention to detail and its massive scope. Namely, the general nature of the writing is utterly consistent, with no variation in looks or quality. Experts concluded that this manuscript is the work of a single scribe. More surprisingly, the continuous uniformity suggests that the creator completed the Codex Gigas in a short period. Experts state that the Codex Gigas would have taken over five years of constant writing to complete. Realistically, this would have required more than 25 years of work. However, the scribe's work shows no signs of aging nor a change in skill or style. The creator's masterful uniformity remains a phenomena. The manuscript dates back to the early 13th century, where it was found between the walls of the Benedictine Monastery in Bohemia. The famous story behind the Codex Gigas comes from the 13th century, also in Bohemia, where a monk named Hermann committed an unforgivable abomination. He broke his sacred vows, and therefore he received a death sentence. The monk was to face immurement, meaning he was to be walled up alive behind the monastery's walls. Just before the final brick was put in its place, the monk begged for mercy. The abbot then offered him a deal. The monk was challenged to create a book that would include all of the world's knowledge, and he was to do it in a single night. As the night wore on, the monk Hermann had no choice but to bargain with his soul. He gave his soul away to the devil in exchange for a completed book. The following morning, the monk presented the abbot with his work, and his life was spared. However, his soul was damned to eternity. The scribe's signature in the book reads Hermanus Inclusus. Hermanus translates as Hermann, whereas Inclusus either means punishment or voluntary isolation. The other author of the book, the devil himself, has also signed it. In between the pages, you can find a full-page illustration of the devil himself. This creature is staring from the blankness of the page, drawn with red horns and two tongues, wearing nothing but an ermine loincloth. It is interesting to know that ermine was only worn by royalty, so this defines the devil as the Prince of Darkness. This picture in particular is what has earned the Codex Gigas its secondary name. It is the Devil's Bible. Hi guys, thank you so much for listening to today's video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to leave a like and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already so that you never miss a video. I'll be back soon with some more terrifying tales. So, until next time, sleep tight.